<clears throat> yes, and I think some more will come along, but I think I will go ahead and start with the introduction. So it is my great, very great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Prajakta Edsul. So Dr. Edsul has a very interesting training path. Um, in 2007, she received a medicine and surgery degree from Parava Institute of Medical Sciences in India, and then went on to get her advanced degrees from St. Louis University in epidemiology, behavioral sciences, and public health sciences. She then completed two postdoctoral fellowships. One is a Fogarty International Global Health Equity Scholar and the other in the Cancer Prevention Fellowship Program at NCI. She is currently an assistant professor in the Division of Epidemiology, Biostatistics and Preventive Medicine in the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of New Mexico and a full-time member of the UNM Comprehensive Cancer Center. Um, she's received numerous awards and honors, including work with international agencies on clinical practice guidelines. And I'm not going to go through all these, but I would like to highlight that she was part of the team that was awarded the 2020 NCI Director's Award for their work on the Last Mile Initiative, which is a public-private partnership between federal agencies, industry, and professional societies and clinical practice guideline organizations to validate self-sampling HPV testing as an alternate to provider collected specimens in cervical cancer screening. She has over 25 peer reviewed publications and a lot more in the works. Um, she's given lots of posters, meeting presentations and invited presentations and something that I do not have any of because I'm old school, she has some great blog posts. Um, she's currently the PI for an NCORE project, a site PI for an NCORE project, exploring the implementation context in community oncology practices for evidence-based lifestyle interventions. And she holds an ACS IRG to develop multi-level strategies to promote the uptake of cervical cancer screening using self-sampling among sexual and gender minorities. I have had the very great fortune to work with Dr. Ed Zool for several years, and I can attest to her passion for research on implementation of evidence-based practices in the real world, in real-world community and clinical practice settings, both locally and globally. Today, despite just returning from India and feeling a bit under the weather, um, uh, Dr. Etzul is graciously speaking on promoting equity through implementation research for cervical cancer prevention. Projecta. Dr. Cook, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I appreciate it so much and appreciate this opportunity to be able to talk to the Cancer Center today. Um, I will just lay out some of the highlights of what I'll be covering today. I wanted to speak a little bit about my own cancer prevention journey um, um, in, in terms of research to implementation science. I lay out my research agenda that I've developed in studying the implementation of cervical cancer screening in both global and local settings and popula underserved populations. And then something that has been close to my heart in the last few years has been how, how can we specifically incorporate a health equity lens in the science of implementation? So I'll just introduce a little bit more on what we've been doing in this space as well. So uh, Dr. Cook did a great job of like transversing my journey, but just wanted to reiterate, <clears throat> I practice as a primary care physician in several resource limited settings in India. And that's where my understanding of the importance of population health and importance of prevention focus was very much um, ingrained in me. And, and that led me to pursue um, uh, higher studies more focused on population health, which at that time in India weren't very prevalent. And so um, I came to the US at St. Louis University and was able to focus on epidemiology but also think about, well, there are numbers, but what about why those numbers exist? And so was able to jointly concentrate on epidemiology as well as behavioral sciences to think about uh, um, public health in that space. Um, my own personal journey, personal uh, experiences with cancer prevention through some of my own family members really emphasized this idea of how could I um, develop a 
my own thinking in cancer prevention. And then being in the US, I was still very drawn to the global health aspects of, of research. So I was very inclined when I was offered this opportunity to do uh, a fellowship with uh, the Fogarty International Center and go back to India and do some implementation field epidemiology work, which is where my love for implementation science started. And I'm hoping to show you some of that uh, work uh, in my presentation today. But for, before I joined as a faculty position in New Mexico about two years ago, actually exactly two years ago now, um, I spent about three and a, three and a half years at, National, at the National Cancer Institute in one of their premier uh, offices dedicated towards implementation sciences and was very fortunate to have the mentorship of the entire team in understanding how to talk the language of implementation science and walk the language of implementation science. Because at that time for me, it was very abstract and coming from a medicine and a public health background, I, it took me a while to understand implementation science um, from, the, from the perspective of the NIH. So just to uh, get into um, the research agenda piece of uh, what I've been working on for the last several years, um, if you think about, uh, I wanted to start by highlighting the global inequities in cervical cancer. And if you look at the IARC data, uh, the International Agency for Research and the global CAN data, you see on the left, uh, the estimated number of deaths uh, among females, cervical cancer ranks amongst the top five causes of death. And on the left, you'll see stark differences in incidence rates and mortality rates for cervical cancer among high income countries and low and middle income countries that are very that have been prevalent for several decades now and continue to grow in 2021 who came up with a, a strategy of 90 70 90 which is 90% of the females to be vaccinated 70% of women to be screened regularly and 90% of those needing it to receive appropriate treatment and modeling studies have shown that if such a strategy was implemented, we could prevent around 62 million deaths in the next 100 years. So this is a very important global agenda. In fact, today is the anniversary, one year anniversary of this WHO strategy being launched and um, has received worldwide attention uh, in, 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 in making sure that the evidence-based interventions that we know work for cervical cancer can be promoted in under-resourced settings. <clears throat> but when you think about it, there is a lot of complexity in studying the implementation of screening. Screening is a series of steps. It involves both the individual level behavior change and that the woman needs to be motivated and educated to come and undergo screening. But it also needs systems and providers to provide access to screening and have effective and efficient healthcare delivery uh, for screening. Um, it is influenced by multiple uh, factors on multiple socio-ecological levels, um, ranging from national, state, and local policies to organization-specific policies and interpersonal dynamics between families and communities and, and individuals that are undergoing screening. If you think about the setting in which screening takes place, primary care is a very dynamic context. Um, it is resource-limited often, no matter whether you are in the global or the local in, in our old, own United States backyards. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of, and usually these are the settings that are providing care to the underserved populations with very minimal resources. Um, they are also in the need for uh, stronger uh, uh, linkages to tertiary care settings like cancer centers to make sure that these screening steps are undertaken. <laughs> so I wanna begin with like talking about a project in India that I was able to do with uh, during my Global Health Equity Scholars uh, Fellowship. And it was really looking at rural and tribal communities in India um, and thinking about how could we implement cervical cancer screening for these women um, in their context. To give you a quick snapshot of the burden in India for cervical cancer, it is the second most common cancer diagnosed among women in India. Current estimates, although these are very over-reported, uh, over uh, according to several of my own colleagues in India, current estimates put, these, uh, put the screening rates at 30%, according to the National Family Health Survey. But from our own experiences in the communities, we really think it is around 10 to 15%, really. 
Um, and we know that several screening tests exist for cervical cancer. Um, if you think of the normal history, uh, the natural history of cervical cancer, um, HPV infection is a necessary cause for cervical um, dysplastic changes, which is pre-cancer, which then would lead to cancer. And in the US, uh, in the past 50 years or so, we've seen widespread and effective use of pap smears, um, which has really reduced the burden of cervical cancer in, in the United States. Around 2014, 2015, um, this newer test, widely popularized in media called the vinegar test, it was the acetic acid application on the cervix and using a visual aid, you could tell whether the individual, the women had a precancer or not. So this visual inspection test was in 2014, 2015, uh, evaluated in a randomized controlled trial and thought to be very effective, um, not as accurate as pap smears, but, it, but much more inexpensive and requiring minimal setup. Therefore, um, important to promote uh, in, in the context of India. So I was at that time uh, doing my fellowship in India and I was very curious to understand, well, we have this evidence-based test. How well has it been implemented and utilized in, in, in India? So I started doing a systematic review in thinking about all of the peer-reviewed articles that had used VIA as a test, the visual inspection using acetic acid test, and found 20 articles with a total of 300,000 plus women at 12 unique urban and rural community-based sites across India. When, when we dug deeper into these articles and looked at what helped um, implement this test and what didn't help, uh, training for providers was essential. Uh, a lot of health education was needed because there was very low community awareness about cervical cancer. And what was an advantage of this test was if you detected precancer, you could treat it with thermal ablation right there and there. And that allowed for the loss, reduced loss to follow up uh, for many women. However, there were significant barriers, uh, lots of logistical challenges. Having done some of this work myself in India, there was very low levels of shared decision-making when women were consulted in, in getting treated there, right there and then. So um, many a times women refused treatment. Um, there was a lot of uh, problems with low participation by women because there was a lot of misinformation in the communities about these programs and what doctors were doing um, in the pelvic exams. And um, just as a bottom line, it was a very steep learning curve for some of these providers to be able to visually identify whether this is a precancer or not accurately. So, Although this was an evidence-based test, there were a lot of barriers in implementing this in community-based settings. What was not surprising in any of our peer reviewed literature is there was very limited information around how best to implement such a strategy in community-based settings in India. At that time, I was working with uh, the Public Health Research Institute of India, which is a community-based organization. And this organization for the last eight years or so when I started working, was delivering free VIA services in the community as well. Located in Mysore, if you see that right-hand side map, it's on the, it's on the southern um, part of India. Um, they were providing free services in the community, but not many women were um, um, partaking in these services. So this was a very genuine question for, for them to try to understand what was going on with um, um, why women were not approaching these free services that they were providing door to door in some cases in, in rural and tribal uh, communities. So we approached this question using a community-based qualitative research um, methodology. Uh, much of this was directed by the community-based organization's own input uh, into what should we study. And we we knew from the outset that we wanted to involve multiple stakeholders, women, community health workers, and physicians in understanding what the problem was on, on the ground. So the most important stakeholder in this was women. And uh, we knew from previous work that we had done with women in the community, traditional focus groups and traditional interviews don't really get at the uh, true barriers of some of these uh, personal lived experiences 
among the women. So there was recognition that we had to go and dig a little bit deeper and use methodologies that could really bring out the nuances for some of these women living in these communities. So we decided to use the, uh, uh, the methodology of photo voice. Um, and what this methodology involves is giving cameras to women um, in their community and allowing them to showcase their own lived experiences to researchers. So we are not directing any of the research questions. Instead, uh, the women are showcasing their own lived experiences to the researchers. And then we make sense of how do we portray some of this work. So I just wanna give you a, a couple of examples of, uh, we published this back in 2019, but um, wanted to give you a few examples of what the women were telling us in, in these photo voice, uh, in these photos that they were capturing. There was a lot of uh, uh, conversations among these women about how important it was, uh, how important was the influence of their husbands and mother-in-laws in health decision-making. So many women in the community thought that they couldn't make healthcare decisions for themselves, instead had to rely on the husbands or mother-in-laws to, to support such decisions. For many, uh, cervical cancer, uh, uh, there was a strong belief that cervical cancer was a fatal disease with no prevention uh, activities that could allow for um, life after cancer. So for them, it was like, why would I take a screening test uh, if I know I have to go and um, <clears throat> my fate is ultimately in this cemetery, right? Like where I, have, I will be dying and I will be um, meeting God. So it's no preventive test can, can prevent this aspect of life. Um, this is a picture of the uh, rotten fruit, which looks nice from the outside, right? So this was a very important message that some of these uh, some of these women were saying is that women in the community have a strong hesitancy for pelvic exams, in that they don't understand that you have to look under to make sure that you know the doctor has to go in and look under for with the pelvic exam to make sure that um, everything is all right. If you don't look you're not going to understand it. Um, and there was a very, there was very strong inclination of a limited knowledge around um, uh, what happens in a pelvic exam and how, how what, what is the outcome of a pelvic exam? So there was just a negative feeling about uh, undergoing a pelvic exam if, if it was not for maternal or child health purposes, right? So <laughs> for maternal and child health purposes, they would like undergo pelvic exams, but not for, if it was not related to children or their, uh, um, their being a mother. <laughs> we also engaged community health workers and physicians in some of this work and uh, community health workers noted uh, several barriers in terms of motivating women for pelvic exams, which is the same thing that we were hearing from women as well. And when we talked to some physicians, both primary care and oncologists, um, they reported a very overburdened healthcare system which was geared towards some symptom-based healthcare and, and not towards prevention aspects. So um, there was a lot of um, reporting of uh, lack of time for cancer uh, among primary care physicians. This collectively between the women, community health workers and physicians led us to really go back to our drawing board and say, you know, it, are visual inspections really um, the right tool for recommending screening for cervical cancer among these populations. We were thinking the newer HPV DNA tests, which were highly accurate, but costly, I'll bet, uh, and required a high functioning lab could be an alternative to pelvic exams, especially because they come with the option of self-collection where the woman can take the brush herself and um, in a private, in their own home environments or in the private uh, environment, collect the uh, DNA sample and um, it could be done in a community-based um, uh, location as well and was a cheaper alternative to the traditional high-functioning lab requirements of HPV DNA tests. So we decided to do a community-based cross-sectional study of uh, this high-risk HPV DNA self-sampling-based cervical cancer screening in this rural part uh, of Karnataka. And our objective was really to just demonstrate the feasibility of implementing such a self-sampling program uh, in a rural setting, because this had never been done before. There were academic medical centers that were um, delivering self-sampling based tests, but not in a community setting. 
So we were very proud of doing this cross-sectional study, especially um, um, because it was the 500 women that we were able to recruit, most of them were uh, you know, below average in terms of, most of them were not educated and 70% were from lower caste. And caste is a proxy for socioeconomic uh, level statuses in India. So this is something that was very unheard of in Indian research studies that reaching the lower caste uh, individuals and women was um, a, a real uh, plus point for some of our work. And <laughs> when we started the, when we went through the screening process, this is where the rubber hit the road. Following up screening, screened individuals was a big challenge. Um, once they were HPV positive, which was around um, 36 out of the 502 um, individuals came back positive. Um, <clears throat> the local physicians in the community did not know what to do with that. <laughs> they just were like, oh, we do pap smears and that's what we know. And so we have to send all of these women to pap smears now. But the newer guidelines at that time were saying, you just have to follow them up, you know, at a lower frequency in, um, um, you have to follow the HPV positive women with a higher frequency compared to the average population. And the guidelines were not really set at that point either. So we really did not know how to implement this several steps post screening. And that is when it became very evident to me that was a series of steps and it's not just this point of care test that you give and you say, okay, I'm done. <laughs> you have to make sure that the follow-ups happen, the diagnostics happen, and that we are integrating into the existing clinical services within the community and the clinical uh, settings. And here's where I understood, I really needed to understand more about implementation research. Um, having this, this work was very much in the, in the 2015, 2016 context. Um, that is also the same time when Indian government was proposing a national cancer screening program. So a lot of our work was actually helpful in, in an advisory capacity for the national program as it is being launched currently. We have continued to incorporate some of the photo voice messages in the educational materials of the community-based organization. And um, we still continue to do self-sampling in that community setting uh, and not in an academic medical center, but now it's become a per uh, out-of-pocket costs uh, system. Instead of research paying for it, we've, we've opened it up to keep it sustainable out-of-pocket. If folks have um, money to pay for it, we could provide HPV DNA testing. Um, since then, we've also like recognized that and this was really highlighted in some of our preliminary data from the photo voice project as well, um, which suggested that community and peer perceptions around cancer really influenced women's behavior, right? So it's the husbands, the mother-in-laws, the peers in the community. And so since then have been really focused on exploring this community level stigma around cancer um, and understanding its influence on uptake. So we've just proposed a case control study to examine uh, stigma perceptions among thousand um, plus women and their husbands. So we want to like do this in, in a dyadic fashion in understanding how do these perceptions of stigma influence whether or not a woman undergoes screening um, in India or not. And there's been a lot of debate around this topic that stigma doesn't exist anymore in India. And so we are hoping that this study will shed light further on, on how cancer stigma um, is important to consider even <laughs> in a much more developed uh, uh, state that we are in. Um, many of my colleagues have shared with me that stigma in today's world doesn't exist. And I think in rural and tribal communities, that is not the case. This is uh, a real issue in so many communities in India. I've been able to use some of this Indian experience to really translate it to global settings as well. Uh, I was fortunate to collaborate with the International Agency for Research on Cancer on, um, on their trial called Estampa. And I can never get the Spanish name of the trial, but I put it up on the slide always. Um, and this was really a collaboration that uh, uh, was um, influenced by the limited literature uh, about implementation efforts to inform the scale up of the 
scale up in the context of cervical cancer screening programs, right? So we don't understand implementation yet. And here we are trying to scale it up to all settings, right? So how do we focus a little bit more on understanding how implementation in one setting works? And then sort of uh, saying, okay, now that we understand it in one setting, we can scale it up to all settings or other settings. So ESTAMPA is a multi-center trial uh, that is evaluating the performance of different triage techniques to detect cervical precancer and inform how to implement HPV-based screening in low and middle-income countries. And what's unique is that they formed this consortium of nine Latin American countries with 12 different sites, including 50,000 women. What we were able to go in is, is actually um, use a formal approach of the pragmatic explanatory continuum indicator summary. It's called the PRESI tool, which allows you to uh, really highlight the pragmatic aspects of a trial based on who's eligible, who's recruited, what settings are these trials happening in? How are the organizations, um, um, the resources and expertise needed coming together to deliver the intervention? So we use the PRESI tool to apply it to Estampa and we're able to generate some of the real world uh, evidence of implementing cervical cancer screening in various countries. And we didn't do this tool only with the main IR team. We also went to the 12 sites and actually asked them and how did they recruit? How did they um, you know, organize their settings? How did they um, um, follow up their participants in the trial? This really, oh, we, we actually were the distinguished poster at the CopraCon conference at Colorado uh, last year for this work. Um, and we've uh, been able to showcase the variability in implementation, because that's the other thing that we've been struggling is implementation, is it, shouldn't it be generalizable, right? So, but that's not the case. When you see one context, you see one context. And so we were able to using this tool showcase how variable recruitment follow-up strategies are in each of these various contexts. So that is allowing us to create a baseline understanding of the variability in implementation, right? And what one of the three overall domains that have stood out for us in, in using this tool with the 12 sites is the various amount, various recruitment strategies that the contexts have used. So, you know, how do you reach the underserved? How do you create these community campaigns? How do you do uh, radio campaigns in some communities uh, or newspaper campaigns, you know? So variety of strategies for recruitment. How do you bring together the expertise and resources? So uh, hiring more nurses, providing colposcopy training. And then how do you follow up? Because often the existing healthcare resources are not enough to do the follow-up work. You know, we do good on the screening work, but don't have enough resources left for following up these individuals. So this, um, this work with Estampa and, and in India has allowed uh, me to be involved in some of this global strategy conversations at IARC and at WHO, uh, where in 2021, they launched the global strategy of the 90, 70, and 90. Um, 90 vaccination, 70 screening, and 90% women identified to be treated. And what, what has been interesting is as these recommendations and guidelines have been put forward, there has been a push to think about, okay, we have these recommendations and guidelines, how do we actually implement them? So I've been very fortunate to be uh, an advisor to the Global Strategy Implementation Work Group, where we've been asking the questions, um, to understand implementation strategies to increase adoption, scale up of screening, uptake of screening, retention of test positive women in care, and improving provider accept acceptability of screen and treat, right? So the, based on these four domains, we've been undertaking a systematic review along with some of these work group members to see what helps with each of these implementation outcomes. But also, if there is no peer-reviewed evidence available, could we interview existing uh, program leaders that are implementing uh, cervical cancer screening programs across the globe to identify what helps to adopt, what helps to uptake, what helps to retain individuals in, in the screening process? 
So lots of work coming out from this group uh, in the next year or so. I'd love to uh, take you from global to a local perspective in New Mexico and talk to you a little bit more about some of the work that uh, I've undertaken and started developing uh, in New Mexico as well. And this really stemmed from my time at NCI where I was also able to detail with the United States Preventive Services Task Force in coming up with the 2018 recommendations for cervical cancer screening. And it was very exciting to learn more about the methodology of USPSTF, which is the premier organization in the United States that sets the guidelines for screening uh, in primary care for us in the US. And really what they try to do through this methodological framework that they've proposed for all of their reviews is to understand um, based on the numbers of questions that you see over there, whether or not um, screening, so for number one question, screening leads to reduced morbidity and mortality. And that really has opened up some of my thinking about how evidence-based uh, decisions are made for preventive services in, in the United States. So in 2018, they came up with this recommendation where they actually, for the first time, in, incorporated a high-risk HPV DNA test as a primary test every five years. So what, what the 2018 recommendation really did is give more choices to individuals with a cervix in, in undergoing cervical cancer screening. However, um, there, there, um, the HR HPV DNA test also um, um, provides the self-sampling option. Um, the self-sampling option has been evaluated in several, several studies showing high patient acceptability um, Yet, um, and, and it also provides no, requires no needs for appointments or speculum examinations, like I showed in my Indian work. Um, in, in, in America, we've also had like the um, home trial, which has shown that we could mail out these kits to women that are eligible for screening. And those could be brought back in the next clinical visit or mailed back as well. However, this has not been uh, widely implemented yet, uh, especially in the US. And in the US, we know folks that are less likely to be screened are women from the lower socioeconomic statuses who have low, social, low educational attainments, racial ethnic minorities, and foreign born individuals. We are also seeing some evidence come in terms of rural counties and areas with geographic inaccessibility, such as the Appalachia, Deep South, US Mexico border. What in that entire evidence base we have been missing is the focus on lesbian, bisexual, and transgender men, who are also individuals who have cervix, but we do not know anything about these, these groups of people. And so for me, that was a very important um, um, sort of minority perspective equity perspective to bring in understanding how, what are we doing for the sexual and gender diverse individuals. And in um, looking at the data coming from BRFSS, which was the only data um, available for New Mexico, we were seeing uh, consistently low rates of colorectal cancer screening, pap test and mammogram among lesbian uh, or gay or bisexual individuals compared to straight individuals. So we wanted to, um, oh, and then there was just no data sh to show differences based on gender identity. What I mean by that is cisgender versus transgender. So there was no uh, information on transgender folks um, in, in, this, in this context. So we were able to get an internal grant award from the American Cancer Society um, and do a sequential mixed method study to understand cancer screening behaviors. Um, and also do some focus group discussions with lesbian, bisexual, and transgender folks to understand how to promote cervical cancer screening in these individuals. Our focus was on residents of New Mexico, 21 to 80 years old age, self-identifying as sexual and gender diverse. And I was supported by a fabulous team from uh, the New Mexico Cancer Center uh, in, in conducting this um, research. We really wanted to do our survey research with an equity focus. So we were able to uh, collaborate with this um, amazing service provided by the USPS um, United States Postal Services called the Every Door Direct Mail. 
this is basically how we get all of those ads from Walgreens or Target in our mailboxes, uh, which is like distributed uh, consistently to every resident uh, a mailbox uh, when the postman arrives, right? So this is a service uh, we used to distribute flyers all across New Mexico um, with survey codes that folks could um, participate in the survey through their laptop or their cell phone. Um, we also supplemented all these flyers with Facebook and Google ads and emails and did a significant outreach you know, using the the business directory for um, sexual and gender diverse individuals, um, the Cancer Center Community Outreach and Engagement Team, and then some personal email recruitment and Facebook posts by study team members as well. We were very pleased to see of the, so of, of, with all of our efforts, we were able to uh, distribute around 27,000 flyers across New Mexico and make around 400,000 plus impressions through the Google and uh, Facebook and Twitter ads, which resulted in receiving around 5,000 surveys. And we did the surveys in two phases. So we get the eligibility survey first and then send out, sent out the main survey with the, with the questions um, um, on a second round. So that allowed us to um, you know, remove all of the folks that were not valid email addresses. So we were able to control for some of the data quality in that, in that process. So we mailed out 5,000 main services, uh, surveys, and then received 3,000 completed surveys. As is with social media research, you still have to go in and uh, clean up the data quite significantly. We learned a lot in this process. We did not know what were bots and what were human bots and how do you look for fraudulent data in some of these spaces? <laughs> but, but even after um, significant cleanup, which we are actually writing up as a methodology document, because I think that's, this, that would be so useful to the, to, the, um, to the space of social media research and understanding how to um, take care of fraudulent data. But even after all of the data cleaning, we have around 2,600 plus responses in the final data analysis. Very, very proud of the fact that it was outside the metro area in uh, Albuquerque. That's where most of the research happens. So we are, we are very excited when we saw zip codes from all of the five regions in New Mexico represented in our data. Uh, over half of the respondents were between uh, 31 to 40 years old. So that shows a younger population. 40% uh, though were black, Hispanic or American Indian, Alaskan native. So that was very encouraging to see a diverse sample. And 46% had an annual household income below 50,000, um, which again is showcasing the underserved populations were reached by some of these uh, um, methods that we used. Yeah, we, we were recently awarded um, some of the, uh, from the AACR minority, um, I'm like missing on their name. It's the Minorities in Cancer Research Council. <laughs> ACR Minorities in Research Cancer Council awarded us a meritorious award for some of this work just recently uh, in October. I don't have much data analysis to show on this because we are still <laughs> figuring out in understanding how to um, um, counteract fraudulent data. Um, but we are now at the space where we are um, also figuring out how to meaningfully describe sexual orientation and gender identity data, right? So we had 11 options for sexual orientation, 11 options for gender identity. But when you come to analysis phase, how do you meaningfully uh, analyze some of these subgroups without distorting the meaning behind the data that we are trying to uh, um, convey from this work? Um, Meanwhile, we've also realized that we need to engage with the communities uh, from um, the sexual gender diverse communities to develop our next steps for this research. So we just recently held our community engagement studio where 11 members from the community gave us advice on how best to represent this data, what was meaningful to them and uh, how to uh, portray or disseminate this data within the community as well. So we are doing some of this work uh, ongoing as we are trying to write up this data as well. 
I also wanted, since I'm talking to a cancer center at Colorado, I also wanted to highlight a few of the ongoing projects in New Mexico and the Four Corner States. Uh, the project that I just mentioned to you that we did in New Mexico, we were able to get like pilot monies from the GMAP program uh, to conduct a similar pilot in Arizona focused on cervical cancer screening among uh, sexual gender diverse communities. Um, I also have a recent contract funding from the state of New Mexico to produce a white paper about colorectal cancer screening in New Mexico, which is using some of this equity orientation again uh, to bring to light how do we promote screening in um, some of our underserved populations. And then just recently, we were able to complete a review of the cancer control plans from the four corner states to examine the role of implementation science in promoting the uptake of evidence-based interventions for cancer prevention and control. And that paper is in review at health promotion practice currently. So we're very excited that we've grown beyond New Mexico and tried to incorporate the four corners perspective in, in this work. So I just wanted to pivot a little bit and talk about some of my recent focus um, on health equity. And it's really shaped, it's been really shaped by my experiences growing up as a Dalit in India and practicing as a primary care physician. And I found a lot of meaning in incorporating equity into my own research focus on implementation, both in global and local healthcare settings. And today I'm a recent citizen of the US faculty at the research institute. And um, my home sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblos of Sandia. So this has uh, inspired in me a deep commitment to continue this conversation with a focus on equity, which I perceive to be more sol solutions oriented um, to address disparities. So I was very fortunate to be at NCI when the Consortium for Cancer Implementation Science came about in 2019. And that is when we had um, now uh, in 2021, uh, we've had now three meetings of the consortium and you might recognize some familiar faces from Colorado, maybe not on this side, but um, on this slide, <laughs> where we've really uh, brought this consortium together to foster collaborations, um, improve networking and dissemination, and target underrepresented areas within the science of implementation. And within the nine objectives that they've set forward in this consortium, I've been very fortunate to co-lead the equity and context uh, work group over the last three years uh, with Rachel Shelton as my partner in crime. And this really um, was important from, the United, from both the United States perspective and from globally. Much of my equity thinking has come from a global understanding where we think of socioeconomic status, uh, but within the US, it's often in relation to race and ethnicity but which br brings up several opportunities to consider other social and structural determinants of health, like disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic status, and geography. And for uh, so many of us, 2020 was a year of reckoning with rec regards to social injustices, which was reflected in law enforcement um, and how they treated Black Americans and the racial disparities that we've seen in the pandemic outcomes as well. So for us in implementation science, it is important that we recognize the long history of health disparities research and equity research, especially CVPR, community-based research and participatory research, and harness the synergies in both these fields to bring together a focus on equity within all of the implementation science studies that we do. And for me, um, health equity really is different from health differences where we are just noting different health outcomes between two groups. Health disparities are when these differences are due to, are concerned with social justice. And health equity is that principle underlying commitment to reduce and ultimately eliminate disparities. With that focus, um, we've uh, really, thought a lot in this working group in making sure that we are not reinforcing health inequities through the science of implementation. Because guess where we do our implementation science studies? It's usually the settings that are ready to do such research, that, that have the capacity to do such research. And in, and, and in doing so, are we inadvertently exacerbating disparities, right? And not focusing on the communities and populations and settings that um, do not have the capacity to participate in research. We 
in implementation science, always think about equity as foundational, but don't really make it explicit. Uh, we want to reach the underserved populations. We want to reach uh, people that don't are not typically incorporated in the research, but we are not very explicit about it. And as I said before, we need to recognize the extensive literature base, but important to contextualize this literature base in the science of implementation. So I've been writing quite a bit about uh, thinking about, you know, how do you address structural racism in implementation science? How do you apply an anti-racism lens in implementation science? And then we've been even thinking about um, cancer prevention and control and how do you ground your implementation science research, implementation science studies uh, in health equity for cancer prevention and control. So some of this work is upcoming. Um, but with that, I just wanted to leave you with some future directions that I particularly am very interested in, um, in thinking about how do we build a pragmatic research agenda for implementation studies? Um, we don't need to be, um, you know, controlling all of our studies such that the real world is still missing out of even implementation science studies. So how do we get pragmatic about proposing? Um, and it's, it's a difficult road. I am the first to attest that <laughs> proposing real world studies is, is really challenging. And then there are pandemics that come out of, the, out of nowhere and <laughs> make it even more a challenge. Um, but yet, how do you keep going on this, uh, on this uh, pragmatic research agenda journey? I'm also very deeply interested in incorporating a systems thinking approach because that's what is needed by um, resource limited public healthcare settings. They often do not have the capacity to think about it from a whole systems perspective. It's crisis mode in, in primary care settings. It's one day at a time and you make it work and you go home and you start the next day <laughs> um, the same way. Having worked as a medical officer in some of these settings, I understand completely how that works. But how could we bring these newer tools to these settings to enable a more uh, robust research agenda in these uh, settings? And then how do you engage communities and incorporate best practices described by the community partners in your research, right? So we might have uh, what we think is the evidence-based intervention, but when you talk to communities, they may not perceive that evidence-based intervention uh, as, uh, applicable to their own context because it was not studied in their context, right? So how do you balance this tension between what evidence-based intervention uh, we know work versus the best practices that the community say? So very encouraged in thinking about, you know, how do you think about um, incorporating community and stakeholder voices in, in your research? With that, um, it always takes a village to bring all of these studies together. So um, several acknowledgements here, um, but I'll take any questions if you have. Thank you, Prajakta. Um, that, uh, that was really interesting. I have uh, a question. Um, I'll start out um, as other people think of their um, questions. Um, I am curious, in the survey, the uh, online survey that you did with the sexual and gender minorities uh, through your ACS work, um, you had you had different ways that you you know approach these people. There was the every door direct mail. There was you know getting to particular um, groups that already had a list serve and all that kind of stuff. Do you know from the, the final, you know, 3,000 people or whatever who finished your survey itself, do you know how they heard about it? Do you know which one was more effective in terms of reaching people? We asked them. So they told us um, social media trumped everything. Really? So, so was, the, the flyers, see, I'm particularly interested in this every door direct mail because I usually throw that stuff away, right? So, or I recycle it. I don't throw it away, I recycle it. So I'm just, I was just curious where you had the best success. It was, so we asked, uh, check all that apply. Um, and the top three were uh, social media, flyers was the second and friends and family were the third. 
Uh, so it's a very interesting group. I, yeah. I, yeah. I, yeah, it's because I truly do believe that uh, this group is very interconnected. Um, so social media sharing is very, very uh, prevalent in the sexual gender diverse community and friends and family. Um, I know that because I received a lot of emails on our study email suggesting, asking if they could share it with their friend who had cancer. You know, and so it was, it's a very interconnected community. So I really do think like social media and friends and family were the top and flyers were like, they showed up as the second most uh, common way that they heard the study, but I'm not sure that that was the best way to reach the sexual gender communities. I'm very glad that we supplemented it with social media ads as well. Yeah. If I was to reach non like if I was to do this as a non-sexual gender diverse community survey, I still think the flyers were a great idea. Um, but like, it's hard to like uh, tell which resident area is a, is a LGBTQ friendly versus not, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's, yeah. I, we even had it on our flyers. If this doesn't apply to you, please feel free to share with a friend or a family. Yeah, yeah, so I do think that there is value in exploring this survey methodology for a non-specific subgroup population um, when you're thinking of a population-based survey. Yeah, you know, I was just wondering if it would work actually if you were like targeting a, a type of cancer patient, like, you know, you wanted to to, you know, get a survey, say on breast cancer survivors or something. I was just, I was just thinking, would that every door direct mail kind of thing kind of work? But I don't know. I mean, I, I did an estimate the other day, speaking of breast cancer, that, you know, there's probably about 50,000, there's more than 50,000, you know, breast cancer survivors in Colorado right now. Um, and I was just, I don't know if that would be effective to reach them or not. You know what I mean? So I, I, yeah. Yeah, so it's interesting. Thanks for sharing that. Do we have any other questions from the group? Stacy? Projecta, it was great talk. I was so happy. I was so sad the last time that you were here that I missed it. And I'm so grateful that it's it was a little, the Q word on the inpatient side. I can't actually <laughs> say it out loud or people will start throwing things at me. Um, my wannabe epidemiologist, was really struck by the idea that 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 cervical cancer is such is is that high of a leading cancer in India, and just wondering and 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 recognizing how important your work is in that setting and and is that because of such such lower screening rates at baseline? Why is that? Or or do I just am I not recognizing that 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 it's higher in the U.S. too? I'm not sure. So I'm not sure um, in terms of etiology, um, if there are any differences from a population perspective, it is a disease. Cervical cancer is a disease of uh, the underserved populations. It's, it's a disease of poverty. It's a disease of, you know, not having easy access to um, treatment. And, you know, um, during my medical training itself, I saw fulminant, you know, cervical cancer cases, which are unheard of in the United States where you know that that doesn't exist in the United. We have a very good system in which we could catch uh, pre-cancer early. There is no such system in India. There is nobody who does um, um, population-based screening at all. Even opportunis opportunistic screening only happens when the patient is coming for her um, child deliveries or you know all of that. Like after, after child care, child deliveries are done, the woman does not visit a hospital ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there is just this lack of awareness, but also a lack of access and um, together, I think, contribute to that too. Raj, did you have uh, So um, thank you very much for a lot of really great data and especially um, data from India. So a couple of questions. First question is, do you think there's any change um, in, in these cases in India at the present time compared to when um, you were there. And the second question is that, do you think that a lot of this decision making related to uh, mother-in-law, I will start mother-in-law because 
I'm from India, so I know the system and culture. Uh, Mother-in-law and uh, husband has to do with uh, some kind of economic structure. So I think the first part is, um, let me handle the second part first. <laughs> so with the cultural differences, there is um, um, a, a, a large, I think, change happening with financial um, security where, where more women are now uh, out in the workforce. So there is, in the last decade, we are seeing a lot of this change where they're handling money of their own. So they can spend how they want. They can go get the care that they need, you know? So there is some change that is happening in the cultural where the decision-making is becoming more squarely in the space of the woman versus the family, um, especially because of the financial security that is coming into, uh, um, into the community in India. But uh, having said the, the data change, you were asking in the first part, you know, is cervical cancer now different in India? You know, there's been a lot of debate in the Indian data because the current, just the recent uh, registry data that we've seen is showing a very significant dip in cervical cancer. That's what I'm and asking. Nobody, yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure you're aware of that. And yes, we, I am aware. We, I am aware. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just quickly want to add one more um, point uh, and then other people can ask the question. So in your answer to my second question is the first answer. Um, what if you also bring the literacy and the rural population, then your answer doesn't stand very well because most of the women in India are uh, illiterate, especially related to rural and, uh, um, you know, uh, like in the in the bottom quartile of the social economic status. Most of the data uh, where you presented and your point of uh, uh, family making the decision lie more with those people, which has not changed a whole lot, uh, even today, in my view. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I, what I speak is a very overarching perspective. It's not, I think there are subgroups that we still will still be uh, will still not be on the on the trajectory you know rural tribal communities in india for example they don't still have any financial security any you know the, the progress is very very slow in some of these communities so we we will still always need an additional effort to be made for some of the communities even for example even in urban communities there is a very big slice in india it's very peculiar I can't ever explain it to a non-Indian, but even in urban communities in India, there is like huge slices of population that are equivalent to rural communities, you know, I, I, the slum areas, the, 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 I, I, you know, so I can never, it's not just urbanization cannot be considered as urban in India. Yep. Because yep. within that urban, there are slices of rurals and absolutely, tribal absolutely. Work, yeah. and poverty absolutely. is really stark. Disparities are very stark, even in the urbanized yeah. India. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very, uh, very important topic which you just talked about. And uh, Jamie has dressed in suit and tie because he was late to introduce you. So I'll let him talk now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful to see you, Projecta. I was wondering, um, you mentioned that you were asking the on your survey about lung, and I was one lung cancer and, and wondering what kind of questions you were posing about um, to the LGBTQ community. So I was not inclined to include them, but I had a very strong medical oncologist that was like, no, 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 you cannot do a survey without <laughs> including smoking and uh, lung cancer questions. So we did ask about smoking and we asked it in terms of like, um, um, you know, regular smoke, ever smoked versus never smoked. And then we asked at least hundred cigarettes in a lifetime. Have you smoked at least? Jamie. 60% said yes. So this is a community that is, um, we're gonna to have to like look more deeper into and in thinking about lung cancer um, in this community. Um, but when we asked about lung cancer screening only, um, cause you know how I uh, stratified the screening questions by age and eligibility. So mm -hmm. only 18 <laughs> people in the entire survey were eligible to answer those questions of which, so it's very, very small data, but uh, of which 50% had never been screened for lung cancer. 
So a lot of folks that are eligible, but um, you know, there's a lot of work to be done in this community, even because of the high incidence of smoking. Yep, and that that's and we're headed straight into that area, and um, you know, just um, really working on developing the extensive communications and and uh, trust and relationships with organizations at this point before we even think about doing data collection or message design or, or things like things like that, and 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 you know being being new to the community um in colorado being you know during a pandemic has not made these things easy you know i could i could do this study in 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 kentucky not too uh, much more easily than i could in in colorado but doing it in colorado is the right thing so um i you know you're going to be getting a call so just expect <laughs> yes well, thanks again, Project. I think we're out of time. Uh, there's always more questions, but um, really, really, this was <laughs> truly wonderful. It's so it's so nice to see you progressing so well in all your research. So thank you again for giving this. Thanks. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye. 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 -bye.